We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions through the website. That way they text and I get a nice notification and I go in my email. So they're like in two different places. I'm not going to say no to a question asked by anyone anywhere. Since it's July 1st, Canada Day today, while we're recording, we thought it would be cool to highlight some of the best games from Canadian game designers. And we are so sorry. <laughs> Note this list is based on game designers born in Canada, uh, many of which may not live here anymore for some reason, which I'll never understand, and many of whom whose games are being published by U.S. or other game companies. Now, I did consider doing a top list of games from Canadian publishers because there are a surprising number of them. There was way more than I would have thought, or perhaps even doing like top five Canadian publishers because there's enough. There could be a top five. But right now, we're just going to stick to Canadian designers. But if perhaps we can return to one of those other topics in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And we are not following CanCon rules, even though they have moved away from Canada. I, <laughs> they're still Canadian in heart. Uh, I know, you know, Brian yes. Adams no longer can, counts as CanCon for music, even though he was born here. Really? I, but, I uh, don't. But yeah. If we were actually a Canadian radio show, we would have to do this regularly. That's we true. would have to have a certain percentage of Canadian games mentioned on our on our show. But yep. we are not technically a broad, radio broadcast. Nope. But tonight, it's all, at least in this segment of the show, all Canada all the time. All right. Well, if this uh, if the uh, other list of game publishers or top five publishing list is something you're interested in us covering, drop us a note and let us know. Yeah, it's not something on our list, but if it's something people are interested in, we'll do it. I did most of the research for it basically <laughs> by default already. All right, so game number one. Uh, we just talked about uh, the designer of this one, Eric M. Lang, uh, a couple weeks ago on our Black Games Matter episode. Uh, due to the fact that we just featured one of Eric's games, then I'm going to pick a different game. At that time, I featured Chaos in the Old World, one of the most asymmetric games out there, and probably one of the reasons why I like asymmetric games so much. I'm going to go with Rising Sun this time. This is a fantasy feudal Japanese folk on a map game with some really cool stuff going on, including the ability to summon these giant monsters, a very cool tea ceremony system where every round players are going to be partnered up. And one of the most unique and rewarding combat systems I've ever encountered in a board game. It's interesting. Uh, this actually brings back the concept of Kami, which we were talking about for our uh, yes. Katana game. Um, it is, uh, this one's a little more beefy though. It is for three to five yeah. players, not just a two player card game. Uh, and it's got a uh, pretty hefty weight of it. It's, it's over a three on, uh, wow. on board game geek. So it's a, uh, it's a thinker for three to five players. That is rising sun. Up next, we have Junk Art. Uh, this is from the Bamboozle Brothers, two Canadians. That is Jay Cormier and Sen Fung Lim. Uh, this is by far my favorite stacking-based dexterity game. Not dexterity game overall, stacking-based dexterity game, because it's basically like getting a bunch of different games in one box. Because each session you sit down to play, you draw three random cards that actually determine which games you're playing in it. And sometimes you're building your own thing. Sometimes you're working together with teams, with, with other players. Sometimes it's cooperative. It might be timed, or you could be drafting pieces, or you might be handing pieces to your opponents. It's the variety of different versions of stack a bunch of weird wood blocks together that brings me back to this one over and over. Well, it's not my personal go-to choice for dexterity games. There are other ones that, that I would jump on first but yeah. you cannot deny that it is very well thought out and combines an assortment of mechanics and mm -hmm. and play that's just melded together so well mm -hmm. and that is junk art all right on to our first role-playing game suggestion we are going to have a mix of both mix of both role-playing games and uh board games tonight is feng shui or feng shui or however you want to pronounce it i'm just going to go with feng shui and yes i know that's the americanized pronunciation by robin d laws a uh, famous canadian designer if you go to toronto well not during covid if you go to toronto on young street and go to the panera you're probably going to see robin working on this game i am a huge fan of eastern asian cinema 
as well as some Western cinema inspired by it. Kung Fu movies, Wire Fu, Wuja movies, and Gung Fu flicks, like pretty much anything but Zhang Wu. I, I, I don't know why. I, I just love Eastern Asian cinema. Feng Shui takes all of these, like the, the Gun Fu, the Kung Fu, the historic dramas, and mashes them all together into a single world in Feng Shui. You play secret warriors battling through time to protect Feng Shui sites the world over. I love the first edition of this game. Still to this day, love that. And there is an updated second edition out there that was well-funded through Kickstarter, which I admit I've got a copy. I'll admit I haven't read my copy of Feng Shui 2, but I do own it and back to Kickstarter happily. Yeah, this is one that uh, I probably would have gotten to at a con this year had... Uh... Yeah pandemic not broken out but uh unfortunately that'll have to wait till uh con season resumes and that is feng shui up next is sagrada this dice drafting game is from adrian adamescu and daryl andrews uh i gotta admit it's been a while since we talked about sagrada for a while there it was like every episode we were talking about sagrada uh despite that i still really enjoy this game in it, players are drafting colored dice to place onto a stained glass window pattern board. At the start of the game, everyone gets a unique pattern they're trying to build. Now, the trick is, the pattern's going to need certain colors or numbers in certain spots, and you can't put a die next to another die with the same color or number, which makes it way more thinky than it looks. Yeah, no, I know a lot of people who really love this game, and I see pictures of it pop up regularly, and people say, hey, this is what we were playing today or this week, uh, pictures on Twitter. Uh, it's, it's interesting it's, to note, so Pennywise in the um on their the cast noted they are both colorblind, notes that Sagrada is not colorblind friendly. I did not realize that. That is disappointing. Like, I wonder if they could put out special Sagrada dice so the pips are symbols. So instead of all circles, you have triangles on one color, squares on another color, diamonds on another, or something like that. I'm actually, I'm surprised I hadn't heard this before. That That's disappointing to know. Yeah, no, that's not, I guess it, in, in, in hindsight, not surprising. Um, True. <laughs> yeah, you got red and green dice. So yeah. If you put red and green together, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you hit most the most basic form of colorblindness. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that was Sagrada. All right, next, Lanterns the Harvest Festival. This is a very unique tile laying game that comes from Christopher Chung. In Lantern, players are trying to collect sets of different colored lanterns by placing four sided tiles. Now, on each side of the tile is a color of lantern. The neat bit here is that when you place down your tile, you're going to get one lantern for each side you match. And that seems like the kind of thing you'd see in every tile laying game, right? But then everyone, yourself and all your opponents are going to get one more lantern based on where they're seated in relation to the tile that was just played. And I love the fact that this game's all about helping yourself without trying to help the other players more. Yeah. Uh, so the helping mechanic and choosing how much to help rather than basing everything off of negative actions against players is really such a great thing to see in a game conflict through conflict through minimization rather than reduction mm. or harm. Uh, so that gets you Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. All right, back on the RPG horse. Next, I have High Plains Samurai by Todd Crapper. I first got to try out this rather unique role-playing game at Breakout Con 2017, then got to play again with Todd running, Todd the designer himself at QCC in Buffalo, New York in 2019. And now I'm hooked. After, after those two games, Todd had me sold. Now, Todd has mashed up Kung Fu, Mad Max, Fist of the North Star, a bunch of other animes, and probably 20 other things in this over-the-top, crazy, cinematic, post-apocalyptic storytelling game. Now, I've actually got signed copies of this one in my collection because I liked it so much. Now, for people interested in checking it out, in addition to just High Plains Samurai, there is also High Plains Samurai Legends, which is a more streamlined edition, a smaller book, more affordable, that includes set scenarios and pre-generated characters. Well, sadly, my chance to give this one a try has been plagued by, well, the plague. But <laughs> that is High Plains Samurai that I'll get to eventually, one of these days. One of these days, one of these days. I want to see someone other than Todd run it. I think that that would be fascinating to see. Cause I got to admit, I've only played with the designer and, and Todd runs a good game. So 
Up next, I have Santorini. Uh, this abstract strategy game is based on the island of the same name. It was designed by Dr. Gordon Hamilton, which in board game industry is mostly known as just Gord. Gord designed a number of abstract games over the years, but Santorini is definitely the most popular. It's the one most people know. Uh, there are two things that I love about Santorini. The first is how awesome it looks on the table because you are slowly taking turns building up the white walled blue domed buildings that you see in the island of Santorini. And it like you literally are just building them with plastic pieces and it looks like all the pictures you've seen. Any place you go to buy euros, you've probably seen a picture of Santorini on the wall. And second is how quickly the game plays despite being very tactical. Like this is one of those games like chess. Like yeah, I can teach you the rules in five minutes, I can't teach you chess in five minutes. So checkers is a, a better example. I can teach you how to play in five minutes. All you do is move and then build something. And the first person to get to the third floor wins. I basically just gave you the simple rules. And once you play with someone where it clicks in, it gets so cutthroat and so thinky. This is a fantastic game. And then you throw in the God rules to give everyone special powers just to mix it up once you've already mastered the basic game. This is one that anyone who likes abstract games should seek out and find. Yeah, and I think this is probably one that surprises a lot of people as being Canadian or even yeah. North American as it has a real Euro vibe. Though I'm sure many would probably argue that a game that looks that good on the cable table can't be a Euro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. So that was... It definitely is. It, it's a, I, yeah. you're, our abstracts Euro. I don't even know. Like, they don't really fit. They're not thematic, so I guess they're not Amerithrash. Yeah. Like, to me, that's the third category. It's like you yeah. have an Amerithrash, you have a Euro, and then you have abstracts. Because abstracts are just something different. Well, that was Santorini. All right, this one's a surprise of mine. Uh, 1812, The Invasion of Canada, which I guess I should have figured as Canada the name. Uh, this is by Jeff Stahl and Bo Beckett. I actually had no clue until doing the research for this topic, that this game was, at least in part, one of the two designers can, is Canadian. I am happy to see it, though, because I really dig this game from Academy Games. This is from their uh, Birth of America series of games. Um, this is a light, not too light, lighter, card-driven, cube-based war game that is extremely approachable. And this is the game that I recommend, this or any game in the series, really. It doesn't have to be 1812. Personally, I like 1812 also because uh, the region I live in was a big part of the War of 1812, and cities that I've been to and forts I have walked through are on the map and part of the game. So histor it's, a, it's a historically relevant game for what it is for, for, for our area. Like, if you know someone who's like, oh, I love Euros, oh, I love Catan, but I kind of want to try a war game. Like, you know, Hex Encounters and all that. It, this is, a to me, the gateway war game. This is one of the best ways to, to dip your feet into what war gaming can be without having to go whole hog and look at a giant binder like Advanced Squad Leader. It's also one of the best team games I've played. They did a brilliant job because it's actually a, an lopsided tea game with three players on one side and, five, and two on the other, five total. And I honestly think the game really shines at five players you can play it two three but five players you really get to see it well i wonder do you have one last giant battle after truce is declared it would be a historically <laughs> accurate way to finish out game turns i uh, know uh, you do not actually that's not in there but uh, truce does get called that is one of the the way the game ends is all the players on one side have played their truce card and then it's whoever owns the most cities wins for anyone uh, not a history buff, uh, after the truce was declared, uh, a massive battle occurred because no one told the folks uh, at the uh, at the Battle of New Orleans that uh, there was already a truce declared. Uh, but that was 1812, the invasion of Canada. All right, next back into the story games is Diaspora. This is a role playing game from Brad Murray of VSCA. Uh, productions. The story behind this one is is why I bought it. Is you had a group of gamers who love hard sci-fi, right? So like you're you're we're, we're thinking starships and spacemen, but we're thinking Larry Niven versus say George Lucas, right? And what they played at the time was Traveler because it was the closest they could find to a hard sci-fi role-playing system, but they really didn't like the D6-based system in Traveler. Then they discovered Fate, and this game came out early in the in the Fate history, like, like Spirit of the Century Old Fate, and immediately went to work converting the current Traveler game to this new system of Fate. And then a couple years later, 
they released it and diaspora is the end result so it is traveler redone in the fate system yeah i really need to get more fate games under my belt because I, I get the concept and it, it, it makes sense and i understand it i even have my fate dice over here uh but uh i i just because i haven't played a lot of them i struggle to picture when they're discussing the the the, mm -hmm. the resolution and, and, the, and the method of playing a fate game uh, but I am definitely interested in, in, in the Diaspora one specifically because I am a hard sci-fi. Yeah, lover. you are definitely a fan. So I'll, um, I'll admit, I'm, I'm definitely more on the George Lucas side of things. Give no, me my no, laser absolutely. guns and starships. Yeah, yeah. But I love Traveler. So it, it was that's why I went to it. And I totally agree, 100%. If it was not for playing Iron Edda under Tracy, I would not grok feet. I could yeah. not get my head around how things worked, how created advantage work and how the aspects in play worked and how having a business card on the table that said fire meant my character was on fire. Like it just did not work. Yeah. And it took sitting down and actually playing for it to make some sense. And I will admit at this point, still some sense. I'm <laughs> still scared to death to try to run a fake game on my own. Yeah, I'll no. play one, but I don't think I want to run one, especially not even with my regular group of, you know, old school, traditional D and D Warhammer players. I just can't see it going off well. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's definitely something that you need to uh, step into. And again, I, the same thing. I, I did Ironetta with Tracy, uh, and it was a great experience, but it was just an experience. It wasn't a learning experience. It was a con game. So yeah. I, definitely, I would love to get some more Fate XP under my belt. See, but, I think you played the second game I played with Tracy, where the first game before he started, I actually had him break down Fate for me. Right. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, look, I played, I have played, I haven't played Fate, but I've read it. And how, how does this, how does this work? Like, okay, I get this. And I had him actually draw some aspects out in that. And I don't think you were in that game. So that's probably what you missed that I got. Ah, and that was Diaspora and a discussion of Fate in general. <laughs> yes. Hey, it happens. Yep. We, we, this, 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 is, this is why we have a show. We have banter. We talk back and forth. It's not just a list. All right, up next, Catacombs from Aaron West. Uh, this is another one I didn't know off the top of my head was Canadian. When doing the research, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, of course that's Canadian, because I have seen Aaron at every Canadian con I have ever been to, which isn't a lot, but also every Canadian con I've ever seen advertised. If there is a con in Ontario, Aaron is there showing off Catacombs. Catacombs is a very unique game. It is a dungeon crawl, like a, a full-on dungeon crawl, like think Descent or possibly even Gloomhaven. But instead of using dice or card-driven, it's a flicking-based dexterity game, like think Pitch Car or Crokinole. Like one player does the flicking for the bad guys, and all the other players control their own hero. You flick to move your character. If you're an archer, you have arrows, and you put your arrow on the board, and you flick it, and the mage has a fireball, and you put the fireball down, and you flick it, and the summoner summons snakes by flicking them. Like you flick and move everything. This is so neat. And, and there is leveling up and there is improving your characters. It has all the stuff you'd expect in a dungeon crawl. But the main mechanic, once you're sitting down and actually playing out a level, is flicking your characters. Now, the one thing you do have to watch out for with Catacombs is they have gone through a large number of iterations and additions. And it's confusing. And each has, as far as I can tell, improved on the last. And I'll admit I'm a little jealous because I had the first edition, first Kickstarter edition, and I don't want to say too much bad about Aaron, but compared to what's out now, man, that game looks terrible because it was all hand-drawn art. There was no color. It was black and white, and you just had stickers put on wooden discs, and the wooden discs weren't rounded. Like, it, 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 looked, like a kick it looked like something he made in his basement because it was something he made <laughs> in his basement. And nowadays, you look at Catacombs, and it looks so shiny, and I, I'm slightly jealous. What I probably should do is just bite the bullet and pick up one of the new editions. So speaking of which, the latest edition that I could find is Catacombs Conquest. And what it is is supposedly a newer, lighter introductory version of the game to get you into the world of Catacombs. I got to say, this is not for everyone. I have had friends I've taught this to that thought it was amazing and fantastic. And I've had friends that said, no, ever make me play that game again. So fair enough. Not everyone likes dexterity games. No, absolutely. And it, it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, there are actually four Catacombs games currently up on their store right now. So there's Catacombs, the third edition, which is the, the, the newest thing, right? the newest version uh well there's they're all core games technically uh so okay. catacombs third third edition is the core of what you got as the first kickstarter 
Uh, and then there's Catacombs Conquest, Catacombs and Castles, and Catacombs Cubes. And they also have expansions on top of that. But those four, uh, Cubes, 3rd Edition, Conquest, and Castles, are all considered core games. Okay. So from what I understand, they are compatible in some way too. I didn't dig into it, but yeah, there's I, like, I think they can all add on to each other because catacombs and castles does a siege. Yeah. It's, it's the one players inside the castle. Someone's outside, but I, cause that one I saw at breakout cause Adam was there. Well, and that was the dexterity yeah. dungeon crawl catacombs. All right. This one makes sense to be Canadian. And this is a, the, the heavy Euro of my list. This is Quebec or Quebec from Philippe Bredouin and Pierre poisson Maki, Quebec, the game, is an abstract strategy euro with quite a bit of weight. It's not the heaviest game, but it's definitely the heaviest game on the list today. Actually, to be honest, I'm not sure when you told me how high um, uh, the, 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 the Rising Sun was. I didn't think, I don't think a Rising Sun is heavy. There are a lot of rules, so this might not be as high as Rising Sun. Uh, but Rising, it's up there. Rising Sun is, uh, on, on BGG anyway, well, uh, above Quebec. Yeah, so... Sorry, it's not the highest on the list. Personally, <laughs> I think this is heavier than Rising Sun. I found Rising Sun much more approachable. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, this, I personally think, is a hidden gem. No one talks about this game, and I don't know why. Uh, it's put out by one of the bigger publishers, Mayfair, one of those. I can't remember right now. One of the big Euro publishers. Nice big box, wooden cubes, lots of cardboard, um, lots of chits. It, the theme is there paste it on as much as any of these you're the head of a family working to build the walled city of quebec you're going to start off with round one buildings and you're going to build different zones and of course in this version of quebec everything's round because like i said it's an abstract it is definitely a euro um you're you are building the walled city of quebec. now the neat thing is along with the the whole city building and resource management and building an engine there's this neat thing where there's area majorities in the corner of the board that represent the, the zones of influence. So you have religion, politics, commerce, and culture, the four things that help build Quebec. And what happens here is you do it in a cask system where the player who wins the majority in one spot gets to take half of their cubes and then cascade them into the next spot. And then if they win that one too, they can take half their cubes again and cascade them to the next spot. It's, an, it's a neat thing I've not seen in another game. If you are into medium heavy euros I, and haven't tried Quebec, I do strongly recommend checking this one out. Like, like no one seems to have talked about this game. I love it. It's great for that, that meaty euro feel. All right. Well, that was Quebec and it's not that much uh, below uh, the other one, uh, but, uh, but it is, uh, I think it's like a three, two to a two, eight or something like that. So there it's, you go. it's within your, it's sort of within that, that fudge factor. That medium you know. heavy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, they're both above the two fives, right? So they're both above that the halfway mark on the uh, on the yep. weight schedule. So that was which, Quebec which for us. The, the main, the one we go with, a, a two five is Race for the Galaxy. Right, that's what we. At least it was last time we looked. Race for the Galaxy was to me the the penultimate two five on Board Game Geek. So it's more complex than Race for the Galaxy, but supposedly lighter than lighter. Than, I don't know, it's so different than than Rising Sun. It, the weight is I such know. a I, yeah. I, the weight, weights are so <laughs> subjective. Anyway. Enough about that. I did Quebec. I think Quebec's harder, heavier, and harder to learn and harder to win than Rising Sun. Up next, we got an older RPG, uh, way older. This is from a Canadian publishing company, DreamPod 9. They made a number of licensed games back in the day, a lot of them anime inspired. But the game I liked best from them was actually Heavy Gear. Uh, this was designed by Philippe Boulle, Jean Carrier. Ali Charest, Jean Marcel, Guy Francois Vela, Marque Veneza. Heavy Gear was their, I, I, I'm going to say it, a ripoff of Battletech. It, it was them trying to do something different from Battletech. But what they were trying for was something you saw in Japanese anime, which was fast moving, quick, lots of action. So they were aiming for a fast and furious mecha battle system versus uh, Battletech, which is a, a slog. It's a slow, big, heavy mechs trundling through the woods, firing off lots of missiles and guns. Whereas these were smaller mechs, more mobile, longer ranged weapons, a lot more based on grabbing cover. The mechs actually had wheels on their feet so they could spin around corners. If you've ever seen like Lelucha the Rebellion, which is a, probably the perfect 
example of the mech style from Heavy Gear. That's an anime that's popular for some people. I it did a neat dice pool system called the Silhouette System, which at the time was groundbreaking to me. It was very different than your standard roll high, roll low on a d20 or your percentile systems. Uh, it was about rolling rolling sets of dice and then making pairs. Well, not pairs, but sets. Like I roll six dice and I pick two to be my effort and I pick another one to be the effect. It did some really neat stuff. It's it's dated. It's old. It's not something I'm currently playing or probably I'm never going to play again, but I still wanted to give it a shout out because I think it did a really cool stuff for the mecha industry in the mecha field like they even went on that the, the people who made the mech warrior video games when they lost the battle tech license put out a, ba a heavy gear video game that used a lot of the same controls as the mech warrior series and i actually own that too and it, again it was neat because your mechs were so much quicker it was just faster battles so yeah it's an interesting history behind the whole uh dream pod 9 uh they were actually formed in order to publish the uh protocol Tradics ma uh, magazine in magazine, north america yeah. Um, and then partnered with Activision to put out the heavy gear game yeah. that turned into the role-playing game, uh, even though they'd already oh, so been developed. The, the, the video yeah. game, the video game came, Activision came before came the role-playing game, but they had been working on some card based heavy gear games sort of previously, okay. but the RPG is actually a, uh, direct, uh, child of the heavy gear. Right. They partnered Fair. with Activision for that game. So that was. Heavy Gear from Dream Pod 9. All right. Next up, we've got some more area majority scoring uh, like we had in Quebec, and that is in New York, 1901. Uh, from Chenet La Salle. I may be pronouncing that one off. Not that my French is ever good. I do apologize for my French accents. I'm, do, I'm better at the French than I am at names like Velada Um <laughs> <laughs> When this game came out, New York 1901, and I don't know why. Like, I don't know where this came from, but when New York 1901 from Blue Ridge Games was announced, everyone was shouting, this was going to be the next ticket to ride. This is going to be the next game that everyone's talking about for years. And I'm sad to report, it never just took off. So I personally would rather play this because it's, it's a game about building skyscrapers in New York. I That has a slightly neater theme, and there's a little bit more to the mechanics than just, uh, you know, uh, Rummy, which is a lot of what Ticket to Ride is. Um, I do see why people compare them, why they say it's this is like Ticket to Ride, because they use a very similar card drafting mechanic where you're, you're grabbing colored cards, and then by having a set of colored cards, you can put up a building, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Uh, this one's really solid. Like It's a, it's a good gateway game. Uh, it's probably not going to keep your heavy gamers interested all that often, but it's a good one to have in your collection for the people that, when they show up, go, hey, I want to play Ticket to Ride. You're like, you know what? How about we try 1901 instead, in my opinion? Yeah, it's a shame. I think a lot of people expected this to be more than what it was, which has led to its current place on on Board Game Geek. Um, and it you read through the the um, the ratings on it, and and really the feeling you get is people were rushing out to buy this game, yeah, and not getting what they expected. So somewhere in the marketing and the buzz around this game, it let them down uh, because it doesn't seem like a bad game. It's no. just not the game that the heavy gamers or the, the, the super purchasers wanted to be. Yeah. Let's say, I don't know. I I'll admit, I don't love it, but I like it as a gateway game. I, I like it as something to introduce people to the hobby. And it's one I will, again, I will strongly recommend it. If someone's like, Hey, I'd like to play ticket to ride. I am not a big fan of ticket to ride. I would push this as an alternative. Yep. So that was New York 1901. All right, I like to try to include these on our list because I am not a huge war game fan, but I know we do have war game fans listeners, and I like to try to represent different areas of the hobby. And I know I've mentioned this one before because there are certain war games I do dig. Um, 1812, which we mentioned earlier, is one, but the going heavier, significantly heavier, is Hammer of the Scots by Tom Dagalich with Jerry Taylor. This is the Scots versus the British in the time of William Wallace. You are literally playing out the movie Bray of Heart, though I'm sure this is probably more historically accurate. Um, this is a multiple award-winning zone-based war game, so that means you have zones, you don't have to follow roads, and you're not on hexes. Um, and it's using the Columbia Games block mechanic. Now, this mechanic is, is brilliant. This is what made Columbia Games, what put them on the map. And that is the fact that you are using blocks that are stood up instead of laying down. So you're taking your chits and you're tipping them up. 
which does two things. First of all, you get a fog of war because you can't see what your opponent has. So you can tell they have units somewhere, but you don't know what units. And second, they actually use the stats and strength of the unit based on which side of the cube is faced up. And you rotate blocks. So if you level up your troops, they turn clockwise. And if they take damage, they turn counterclockwise. And it's different stats show at the top of the, 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 the cubes. And it's brilliant. This is a fantastic system. It's been used by many games. Um, many people, myself included, considered this to be the best two-player block game that's ever been put out. Well, I I am not a war gamer, and uh, and I am not even as interested in 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 the <laughs> the few of them that you are. So yeah. I will just say that was Hammer of the Scots. So oh, I want we used to play Warhammer with all characters. Yeah, no, this I is just cubes instead of minis. Yeah, yeah, no, I I could get into the fantasy it, again. The the fantasy is is, is the big yeah. part of that for me, or was anyway. Yeah, your, your answer then is Wizard Kings. That is the Columbia box game where you play fantasy armies. Right. But that one actually plays like up to 10 players. It's crazy. You can it, It's just a ridiculous large number of players that can play that, though I still think it plays best too. All right. One final role-playing game. Uh, this is the final game I have on our list for tonight. This is one that I absolutely love. I wasn't sure if I should throw this on the list, to, to be honest, because it's partially from a Canadian game designer. Because once you get into big games from big companies with big names, like Marvel Heroic Role-Playing from Margaret Weas Productions, you get a lot of people on the team. Now, the Canadian in question is Philippe Antoine Menard, uh, someone who I actually know really well from the G Plus days, is a Canadian who worked inside, alongside many others on this game, uh, including Cam Banks, Dave Chalker, Robert Donahue, Matt Forbeck, uh, John Harper, Will Hindmarch, Jack Morris, Norris, sorry, <laughs> Jack Morris would be something else, uh, Jesse Skolblum, and Aaron Sullivan. Now, the thing is, Philippe's name is on every book that was published for this awesome RPG. Like, every single one has Philippe's name on there. So I have to assume he had a good part to do with it. So I'm, I'm claiming this as a Canadian game. So we're I, as Canada, we're claiming this. And if you don't like it, we'll go burn down the light. White House like we did in the War of 1812. So anyway, uh, I love this RPG. It was great. The problem is the game died. It, it died like just starting to bear fruit. Uh, Margaret Weas Productions lost the license because the people at Marvel decided they were going to do some new movie thing back in the day. Now, Marvel Heroic role-playing is based dice pool system that to this day is the only superhero system I played that actually lets you pair off heroes and villains that are completely different from each other, and it works. Like, this is the only game I know where Spider-Man can defeat the Hulk by causing him enough emotional stress to make him cry and turn back into Bruce Banner. And that happens mechanically, not just through the story. Curse that MCU film franchise for stealing our role-playing fun. <laughs> yes. But... Alas, that was Marvel heroic role playing. Obviously, that whole movie thing didn't turn out so well for them. So I don't know why we don't still have our game. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Despite that being the end of our official list, I do have a few honorable mentions I want to toss out there. Uh, these weren't included for a number of reasons, some of which I'll mention, some I won't. So the first one I think has to be mentioned is Crokinole. A uh, dexterity game that seems to be, honestly, like in the last two years, sweeping the world. Like every podcast, cast, catch, pod, podcatcher, podcaster, damn, can't say <laughs> podcaster. Almost every podcaster I listen to, including people as far down south as Texas, are suddenly buying up crokinole boards and playing crokinole and going to get their cons. And there was supposed to be an Origins crokinole tournament. Now, I tried to do some look into this to find out who the designer was. It seems to be uncredited, though everywhere does seem to accept that it is a Canadian invention. So, uh, er, uh, Eckhart Wetlaufer in 1876 in Ontario is credited often by See, I, I, as, uh, See, as I as found Crokinole. people that disputed that when I looked at there, up, there, so I there are that. more than likely disputes, but I'm yeah. gonna say it was uh, Eckhart. Wetlaufer in 1876 here in Ontario who created Crokinole, but in 2017 in the city square in Winnipeg, they created Crokinole Curl, which may be the most Canadian oh, game ever, that. which is a giant <laughs> curling rink version 
of Crokinole. <laughs> yeah, that is is definitely Canadian. <laughs> like we got to add a way to snap our necks while we're playing Crokinole. <laughs> Slip on the ice. Totally fair. And yet, uh, I don't know if there'll be a board game of that one. It'll be the same game, right? Yeah. Fair enough. All right, next, I got Kodama 3D. Uh, this is from Erica Boyuris, along with Daryl Andrews. And the reason I throw this on there is because I was supposed to play this. This was literally, like, I run gaming events, or I help run gaming events at the CG Realm on two weekends a month. And Kodama 3D was the game we were supposed to have when the pandemic hit and it was the first event we had to cancel. So I'm throwing that on the list because I really dig Kodama and Kodama 3D look neat. And speaking of Erica Boyoris, she has a very cool looking miniature game coming out this year, which is Scott Pilgrim Miniatures The World, which is coming from Renegade Games, who just had a smash hit with their Power Rangers miniature game. So this one is looking hot. Absolutely. Uh, I, I ran into Erica at the panels for breakout con last year. And she was uh, hosting quite a few of them. Actually, Daryl as well was, was hosting yep. quite a few of them as, as local uh, Torontonians. Uh, and they were really great. And Erica is really involved in the uh, game developers market and the game designers market in Toronto. Mm -hmm. She hosts a lot of the proto T TO events. Um, That's awesome. And so it, it's great to see her involvement, not only in her own games, but in helping other people get their games to market as well. All right, the next one, uh, the chat room's been waiting for this one, it seems, is, but wait, there's more. This is one of my all-time favorite party games. Uh, it's by the Bamboozle Brothers, Sen and Jay, who I mentioned earlier when talking about Junkyard. I didn't re include this on the list for one reason. Um, I already put Junkyard on. But the reason I mentioned Junkyard instead of this is because it is out of print and impossible to find. Uh, I actually reached out to Sen and Jay just this past week on Twitter, and they have covered the license, so they put this out they're just looking for publishers so hey publishers any publishers listen to our show get this game out this game's great like i personally think like smirk and dagger games or um smirk and laughter would actually fit better for this particular one but the, or or even the op these are like the, the company puts out telestrations right like pick this one up how do you not have this cge yeah, with their like, like this is right the up, kind of well, game that's right up. back out there it's right up uh, the Ops Alley, I think, with some a lot of the stuff they're doing these days. Uh, maybe a little light for them. Um, I don't think it's, it's not, doesn't seem like a Renegade property necessarily. No, not, but, but not, more towards not really. the Op. Uh, and Who so that was um, Train of Thought. Train of Thought was another Bamboozle Brothers game. There were another pretty good part game, actually. I wonder who published that or if they could uh, put it out. Train of Thought is Tasty Minstrel. Tasty Minstrel? Okay. Taste Room Insel's done a lot of restructuring, so that one, I don't know. Yeah. They've also done, um, they also did Belfort from Sen. I don't know if Jay was involved in that one. I know Sen was involved in that one. Belfort, I only ever played once with uh, one of the locals, Will Chamberlain, who's in the chat. <laughs> Belfort was a solid game. And that was? I only played it the one time, though, so it didn't get on my list because I haven't played it enough. I love it. And I do love John Cart, so. And that was, All right. but wait, there's more. Yes, but wait, there's more. There is one more. Uh, finally, on the RPG front, I just want to call out uh, one particular person, actually, and their maps. The maps of Dyson Logos. Uh, Dyson is from Ottawa, Ontario, is responsible at this point for creating a mapping style. Like a recognizable, people see it, style of dungeon mapping. Uh, it's based on thick lines and a very distinct form of hashing. I have been a fan of Dyson's work since I found him on G plus back when he was like literally starting off. Like he had a, he had a day job. His girlfriend had a day job. They're struggling to pay their bills to now. He has a Patreon. He has the Dodecahedron books coming out. And at this point, his book maps are showing up in Wizards of the Coast books for 5e D and D. The last few modules that have come out have had Dyson maps in them. And it is awesome to see him go from struggling person who drew maps in his spare time to a full-time D and D mapper, which is just awesome. Absolutely. That's always great to see. Uh, and, uh, and just to, to top things off, I'm going to toss in a couple more Canadian classics for the holiday. Okay. We've got games like Romoli, which is Canadian trivial pursuit. Also Canadian. Yeah, I knew that one. Balderdash. I, I was put that on a top anything list. <laughs> Balderdash a horrible game. and the game of things are all Canadian games, good or bad, that uh, represent some of the history of Canadian gaming. Well, that's and Balderdash it. isn't terrible. Yep. 
Well, that's it for our list of great tabletop games from Canadian designers, plus a few others. Now, let's head over to the lobby to see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add. All right, so the big thing from the lobby, and I think we do have some in there, is what did we miss? What did we miss from Canadian game designers? Now, one of the caveats is I tried to only list one game from each designer because I probably could have done an entire list of Sen and Jay's games and Eric Lang games. We probably could have done a top 20 of just by those designers. So that makes perfect sense uh, of that. So if we missed any from those designers, that's somewhat intentional. Uh, and we were also keeping games that we that we had played, well, so that does li- that definitely does limit things uh, uh, ourselves as well. So, but totally fair. If there's any others we miss, I'd love to have them because we'll throw them in our show notes for people to check out. So I see "Mask of the Red Death" by Adam Wise. Adam Wise, I don't remember finding on my list of Canadian designers at all. Oh, he is. How did I? I wonder how I missed that one. Um, and I mean, uh, like. Yeah. We look at, I mean, just looking at like Daryl Andrews games, um, oh, yeah. he puts out a lot of games. Oh, um, there's war games. I cannot believe how many war games are from Canadian designers. There are a ton. Yeah, no, it's, uh, there's, uh, what have we had? All right, going through the chat quick. Um, Pennywise loves Rising Sun, favorite cool mini or not game. Despite it being on my top list, I actually just sold my copy. Like I, it's just it's it's too big. The teach is heavy, and it only really plays well with five players. And it just doesn't come out enough. And the huge map and the packing away the miniatures, like I dig it, but I just I never actually want to play it. <laughs> I didn't even try all the different rules. Like I got the full Daimyo box, and I never tried the two uh, Eastern Asian teams. I don't remember what they called them, but the, the Golden Empire or whatever. I tried the Kami Unbound, but there was another expansion, the Extra Monsters I never even tried. So Pennywise does note that Sagrada with symbols instead of pips would work. So blue and purple is also a problem. Yep. No, this so Pennywise, an... Ryan in the chat room is actually legally blind. So he has even more sight problems. So he often points out... Uh, accessibility issues with games we're talking about, which we highly appreciate. Yeah. And there's a couple of times uh, that I've, I've grabbed stuff and gone into, there's a couple of um, simulators uh, that take, well, t- you can take photos of, mm-hmm. uh, of your merchandise and go through it and check through all the different forms of colorblindness uh, for stuff like that. So Roxley games, I know they're a Canadian publisher, but I don't know if dice throne is by Canadian designers. I do know Roxley was one of the Canadian companies that came up. Um, Academy Games was located in Canada originally. Mercury Games is Canadian. Santorini is Pennywise's favorite abstract game. It's not my favorite, but I do dig it. Um, Brass, I almost put in because one of the designers on Brass Birmingham which is the newest version where they added beer and stuff. But I don't know how much the Canadian impacted that. Like it's Martin Wallace's brass. Everyone knows okay. it as Martin Wallace's <laughs> brass. So I, I like Deanna and I have talked about that. I'm like, Oh, I, I wish there was a way to know, right? Like even Philip Menard on, on Marvel heroic. I'm like, all right, the fact his name's on every book must mean he had something to do with the mechanics, not just like he's an artist. So yeah. I decided to toss him in there and I had a hard time finding some of the. Uh, so dice throne adventures is uh, Nate uh, Chatelier. Manny Tremblay and Gavin Brown are the game designers. Sound like French names, but that doesn't. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Yeah, yeah, we did have two disc area games. That wasn't on purpose. Quebec, unfortunately for you, Ryan, would not be accessible. Noting that you almost picked it up many times. The designer did PDF historic briefs for Quebec, so I guess it's more thematic than it looked. <laughs> Lots of Milton Bradley games. Um, Cats from Chieftain Games, from what I understand, is a Canadian game. Though I kids couldn't find a designer on that. But wait, there's more we did mention. Yeah, Broken Ole was the number I'm one. Trying to figure out where Manny Tremblay is from, but it doesn't say. Gotta the top him. eight debate. So now that we're in. Um, Beyond Balderdash is better. See, I don't know if I played that. I remember playing the original Balderdash. Yeah, I've never played Beyond Balderdash. 
So now, now that we are in the, the lobby, I do want to give a shout out to a fellow podcast that is the Everyday Board Games. Uh, they are also here on Twitch, Everyday Board Games, one word. Uh, I say that a lot. They had I checked out the show during the virtual gaming con and really enjoyed it. Uh, the two hosts had a great camaraderie back and forth. The show I happened to watch was a top eight debate where they pick a certain criteria. When I did it, I'm going to forget the artist's name, but it was a specific artist. It was all games that featured this one artist. They picked eight games. They put it into a bracket, discussed the merits and flaws of each, and eventually came up with a winner. It was uh, really enjoyable to watch. I, I stayed there for the entire show. I was just going to check in, and I'm like, nope, I got hooked. So I stayed around, so that was pretty cool. Uh, Vincent Dirtrait was the artist that they featured. Uh, and Gavin Brown, who's another one of the Dice Throne Adventures person, featured on uh, Brass Birmingham, Super Motherload, Jab Real yeah, Time that was Boxing. The one that was on, yeah, uh, that was the one that was actually, on Brass Birmingham. He's actually got, I'm not sure what his branding portfolio is, because he's got Brass Lancashire and Birmingham down there. Yeah, so he might be an artist uh, too or and something. And Santorini, right? uh, but he's in Calgary. Huh. But he's, he's definitely Canadian. So uh, Gavin, Gavin Brown is definitely Canadian. There you go. Fair enough. Super Mother Load, I haven't tried. I've heard it's Dig Dug, the board game, and pretty good, but I have not gotten to try it. Um, Jamie did not like Sagrada, really. I actually really like Sagrada. I, it's up there with Azul for me. I, I know a ton of people who just love it. So it's, Yeah, it's... I, I like that one a lot. Hey, no problem. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. And then whoever Nate Chatelier is, is just Dice Throne. <laughs> he's he's yeah, got all the nice throne stuff here, right. but that's all he seems to have done. For Canadian designers, wow, there is a list on Board Game Geek. I'll try to find it again and I'll throw it in the show notes. That is all RPG board game people by province. And it's designers, artists, developers. Like it is a massive list. And that's what I used to make the list today. But I'll admit I gave up partway through. Like there were just so many. And to be honest, I'm on the list, which is like, wow, they, they found me. <laughs> They must be thorough. Yep. Because I, I have designed a couple free RPGs and that's it. So that was pretty cool that I'm like, man, my name's on the list. I didn't feature my games. I wasn't that self-serving. I don't <laughs> think they're good enough to belong on this list anyway. Um, all right. I think we're good to move on. I think all that's it for right. The chat room right now. Thank well, you all for interacting. That's it for our main topic tonight. You can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Gaming Advice at the top of the page. Finally, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email me directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.